Hello, everyone. Today is Thursday, September 8, 2016, and this is the week in charts. So what do we talk about? Well, current market conditions, as usual, your questions on trading, your favorite stock picks. If you don't mind, wait until we get to the actual charts, and we'll get there as quickly as possible. And also, when you ask about a stock, you can ask about as many stocks as you want, but just so I can keep track of what I've talked about, just hit enter after you ask about a ticker. And this week, with the passing of Yogi, I thought it'd be a good time to reflect on the wisdom of Yogi and how he could have been a really good trader. And we talked, um, if you follow along, you'll notice a, a lot of my columns, I'm often quoting Yogi. And sometimes I'm quoting Yogi and I don't even realize that I'm quoting it. And we'll get into all that. In fact, let's just uh, dive right in. I guess before we do that, is claim the screen, as you know, you could lose money trading, or as I often like to sum it up, stealing a line from my buddy Greg Morris, all predictions about the future, and a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. Yogi Berra once said, you can observe a lot by watching. And I fully agree. And one thing I woke up thinking about this morning is, if you go through my nightly analysis, you're really going to have a good feel for what's going on in the markets. And most people weren't willing to do this type of homework. And I could probably make a lot more money if I told everybody, yeah, you just push a button, you get a peanut. Trading is pretty easy. Uh, you know, give me a bunch of money and, and subscribe to this or whatever. Or, but the reality is it's hard work. And um, who was it? Uh, said that, that that's the problem with uh, success or whatever. It, it goes around. Um, eh, anyway, <laughs> what is that quote? Uh, something about, uh, was it Thomas Jefferson or something? The problem with opportunity is it's, uh, it, looks, it's, it wears overalls and it looks like hard work. Anyway, so one thing you need to do is, as I often preach, I like to look at the new high list and ask yourself, are there a lot of issues that are at or near new highs? Or there are there a lot of stocks in emerging trends? So is some new area beginning to emerge as the next big thing? Or there are there a lot of stocks in established trends? Emerging would be a stock that's in some sort of transition from lows or from highs to the downside. A established trend, which would be, is something that's in an obvious trend. As they often say, you could draw a big blue arrow on the charts in the direction of the trend. And you need to ask yourself about that trend. Is it persistent? Is it clean? Is it accelerating? And all these things we talk about when we qualify a trend. Now, when you're looking at stocks that are making new highs or stocks that are trending strongly, you need to ask yourself, what type of stocks are there? Are these big cap stocks? Or are these small cap or go-go stocks? Because Sometimes you get a market where I hate to say fundamentals matter because I would never use fundamentals in my trading, but it seems like real companies with real products making real earnings seem to be the focus. At other times, the more speculative, exciting small cap issues, which is our bread and butter, as you know, are doing really well. Not that we won't trade a bigger cap stock if it's set up and looking good and if that's all there is to do and it's worth doing, then absolutely we'll do it. But for the most part, we want to be in these small cap go-go stocks that have the potential to make these huge moves. And we'll look at a couple of those moves in just one second. Uh, are, there, are there a lot of bond funds or REITs or any type of interest-sensitive type of issues that are high up in the list? Are there defensive stocks? Is it food stocks or possibly commodity-related stocks? Is it gold that's high in the list are mostly gold and mostly defensive stocks such as foods. So uh, the new high list is very telling and the stocks that are in your emerging, I'm sorry, in your existing trends are very telling too, but the emerging trends are also important to look at because maybe the trend in certain sectors may be coming to an end or more excitingly, maybe they're beginning to emerge. Not that you can't make money on the short side, but it's much more fun to ride out the long side for a long, long time, as opposed to trying to hang on the shorts. Are there a plethora of setups? Okay. Well, audio's still good here. It must be a squirrel got his nuts 
caught in the wire somewhere between here and England, Phil. Uh, or there are a plethora of setups, and these are recorded, so it, it recording is uh, very good locally. So are there a plethora of setups? If there's a whole bunch of setups, then you really need to think about the possibility of trading. And where are the setups stacking up? What particular sectors, okay? If you're seeing dozens of setups set up in the energies, then, hmm, maybe you should be trading the energy stocks. If you're seeing a lot of IPOs that are set up, then, hmm, maybe you should be trading IPOs. So where are the setups stacking up? And then once you do find an area that looks pretty good based on the amount of stocks in that area, are there any sexy six sisters in the same sectors? Now, this comes a little bit further in your analysis, but let's say you do have a watch list and you've, you've got three or four golds in there and you've got uh, four or five semiconductors. Well, you know that you need to go look through all of the tradable golds and all of the tradable semiconductors to see if there's anything that looks even better than what you already found. It's like being on a treasure hunt. And you just have to dig and dig and dig. And what's going on under the surface is much more important than taking the market at face value. And as you're going through this list of all these stocks and all these stocks within these sectors, ask yourself, did you miss some of the big moves that you're seeing? And we're going to come back to this in a little while. So I don't want to talk too much about that now. And then once you do all that, run a loose parameter scan, which checks for recent highs. Now, the scan that I run is not uh, one that does new highs because we already did that. I'm just looking for recent highs. In other words, not today, but yesterday. Let's call this minus one, or in this case, I guess it'd be minus two. A new high several days ago and I'm only looking for 20 day highs and if you run this scan and I think I've got it set to about uh, oh I don't know eight or nine in here I forget exactly how how many and I'll give you the exact scans it's not a mystery or anything you could you could have them and you can either convert them to your software or if you have telechart you could use my uh, scans exact scans and this is the same thing that I actually do nothing is uh, Nothing is proprietary. Some stuff you have to pay for, such as some of the newer patterns in the IPO course, but nothing is proprietary in what I do. And that's the beauty of it is it's repeatable. I can show you how to do it, and then with a little hard work, so could you. So we're checking for recent highs, and that's going to, in other words, that's going to give us pullbacks. And we're only looking at 20 days, so that's going to give us a lot of stocks. It might be eight or 900 stocks in that scan, sometimes even more. Now, I know that sounds like a lot, but we're not obsessing over each and every chart, and we're sorting it by volatility. And as we get further and further and further down the list, as the volatility gets lower and lower, we'll probably cut off somewhere around 20 in the HV because we really don't want to go too far down into those lower volatility stocks, as I often preach and I've done webinars on this and articles which you can find on my website the more volatile stocks within reason are going to offer you a lot better opportunities and my friend phil over there actually uh pointed that out uh, in in regards with uh with the almanac type of book which was written written but they were talking about the the higher volume stocks well the higher volume stocks in general are going to tend to be lower in volatility uh too so I believe it's better the devil you know when it comes to that. Now, you want to take a note of anything worthwhile that's setting up. I I use watch lists extensively by just uh, hitting F key to flag a stock and copy it over to a momentum list, and I'm going to talk a little bit about this in one second. But the main thing that I like to do, if it's a stock I really, really like, I write it down in a notebook. And... Writing something makes you remember it. It gives you, a, it makes you think about it. It gives you a feel for it. It's just a different way of doing it, other than digitally, because it always kind of makes me a little concerned if I have something digitally, I might forget about it. It's kind of like I've got uh, all these PDFs of all these books I need to read, and I completely forgot, have forgotten that I have most of them. And will I ever get around to reading them? I don't know, but. I look at my office and it's littered with books everywhere. And it's like, well, if I ever get around to cleaning my desk, 
I'll pick up the book and say, well, maybe I should write, maybe I should read this book someday, you know, whereas if it's on my computer, I'm not going to find it. So I think it's important. Do keep all your momentum lists and do go through them all and make sure you're making notes of anything that is worthwhile. Now, when you're looking at a stock and let's say it looks like this and it might have looked like this back here so let's say it's accelerating higher it's persistent persisting higher tends to go higher day after day and maybe it pull back just a little tiny bit well this is not set up just yet you don't want to set you don't want to trade that but you know this is worth watching so make sure you take this stock and copy it over to this separate momentum list. Now, what I used to do, but it caused too much confusion, is each day I publish what I call my Landry list. And if you want to see what that looks like, all you have to do is just go to the website, and you can scroll down for completely free, 100% free, and just watch some recent trading services here, or subscribe to the um, Foresight and Hindsight. But if you click on, if you watch this video here you'll get a feel for what's in that Landry list. Now, I used to put a bunch of stocks or quite a few stocks that were trending on just on the cusp of setting up so we wouldn't forget about them, but that caused a lot of confusion with the client. So what I do now is I only put stocks that are actually set up in that Landry list, unless this is the mother of all setups and it's like really close to setting up. I usually will just put it in a separate momentum list and keep an eye on it. So make sure you keep that separate momentum list going. And then, of course, you want to study the IPOs. Now, the IPOs have been pretty amazing over the last three to four years, and it's been really a phenomenal thing. And I actually got an email just yesterday. Dave, what is this IPO bull market? I was like, I don't know, but hopefully not anytime soon. And as I think I've said repeatedly, when I was contemplating doing the IPO course, I also was contemplating doing – a service possibly shortly thereafter because I'm doing all the research anyway and some of the higher volume IPOs as we'll see in one second do find their way into my core trading service but I was thinking of doing like an add-on service which would be just an IPO maybe limit the number of people and then we could trade thinner IPOs within that because that can't go public with an IPO that's fairly thin but I, even though I still think it has opportunity so definitely study those IPOs, study your momentum call list. And then after you do all that, you have a pretty good idea what sectors are trending, what sectors you want to look at uh, for possible more opportunities, the sexy sister thing I mentioned earlier. And you have a pretty good feel for what stocks you're going to be trading in the overall market. But then also we're doing a, a top down approach in kind of a bottom up fashion. Look at the sectors. Look at all the sectors. There's 239 I like to look at with the uh, telechart. You could, there's uh, what I call the major MIGs. I also keep those separate, uh, which are within those 239. There's only about 20 of those. So at the least, make sure you look at those every day. Take you 10 seconds to do that. Uh, some selected ETFs. Sometimes I look at world ETFs. Sometimes I might look at uh, GLD, which is gold, SLV. So look at the commodity ETFs. Look at the world ETFs. Occasionally, you might take a peek at the VIX and things like that. And I keep a list of ETFs that I that I like to look at, and I add and subtract from that list. And then finally, obviously, look at the indices. Now, obviously, I'll take a look at the indices intraday or right after the close, so I know what's going on in the indices. But the point I'm making is. You want to dig deep within that database first and then work your way out. It's like dive down, dive in, and then work your way out to the broader market. And a lot of times you'll find yourself surprised because sometimes the market will be kind of mixed. And then you look internally, and especially as a momentum guy, you'll think, well, it looks pretty darn good. So the big cap stocks might be underperforming and making the indices look pretty bad, but deep down within it looks pretty good so by the time you do all that you should have a pretty good idea of what's really happening in the market and you're not taking anything at face value and if you do this every day you're going to find that you become really in tune with the markets you're going to 
be in tune with the with the ebb and the flow. You'll be in flow with the ebb and flow, and you're going to be becoming one with the market. That's a little zen for you. And I see Phil's asking a question about zen. That's a little zen, but it's truly what's going to happen. You're going to have a pretty good feel for what's going on, and you'll see some people. And I don't want to throw anybody under the bus, but you'll see certain people out there who tend to be more journalistic in their market reporting. Let's just put it that way, as opposed to I try to at least throw something out like, hey, this is where I'm seeing opportunities. And I'm talking about in free content. I'm not talking about in paid content, but in free content, at least I'm trying to give something of value out there as opposed to just reporting what the market did. We could we could see what the market did. Tell us what's really going on under the surface so you're going to become one with the market and once you do the point i'm getting to here is you're going to see commentary that just reports and you're going to find yourself uh almost uh, not not angry but you're going to think like well they have no idea what's really going on because they they think because the indices are at new highs or they went up a certain amount or whatever that everything is peachy but you might know better or just the flip side, they'll think, oh, market looks weak in here. And you're like, well, no, it's not. There's a lot of emerging trends that are coming up. There's a lot of stocks that are trending and so on and so forth. So you will become one with the market. And that's kind of like a beautiful thing. And I, and I kind of framed it a little bit negatively, yeah, negatively there. I didn't mean to go off on that tangent. But the point I'm trying to make is it's going to start to click with you. And that's just such a beautiful thing. And you just kind of roll your eyes at some of these other commentaries because you're like, wait a minute. they don't." They don't really know what's going on, and it's important that you really know what's going on. So i got to really drive that point home. Now, once you begin to get a really good feel for what's going on, you're going to find that things won't come as a big surprise. You won't get blindsided by these big developing events. Yes, something bad could always happen. There will be an outlier that will happen sooner or later that just knock, you know, just comes out of nowhere. That's going to happen. But you're not going to be blindsided by these big picture macroeconomic, for lack of a better word, things that begin to unfold. So something like 2008 won't come as a big surprise. And that's why I put a, an S after that, 2008 as a metaphor, because there will be there will be more bear markets. There will be markets that are going to look a lot worse probably than 2008. But what happens if that does happen is you'll likely see it coming and you're not going to lose half of your money like the average money manager. Now, I would never personally throw anyone under the bus, but it sure did seem like a lot of money managers just followed the market lower. When I was doing the research for layman's, I think the market was down 39.75% in 2008. And the middle of the year was down half, it was down 50%. So it, it halved in value, and the average, so was the average money manager. And if you go in and look at, let's just pick on the mutual funds. If you go in and look at the average mutual fund in 2008, it was down 39.75%, I think, and so was the market. So it's almost like they perfectly mirror what's happening in the market. And there's a reason why that happens. I don't want to digress too far, but a money manager once told me that these, these, even these stocks, these stock funds that claim to be stock picking, what they do is they buy enough of the big issues in the S and P 500 to kind of guarantee they, they're going to do as bad or unfortunately as worse as the S and P 500. Cause you're not going to really get fired as long as you're in line with the S and P 500. And then their, their stock picking is done on the side and it's really just, I guess the waste of time if you think about it. They might as well just be indexing. But I don't want to I don't want to get in a fight with anybody, so I better get off of that. And you also recognize when it's time to party like it's 1999. Okay. Uh, there's a lot of people that make a lot of money in the markets or have made a lot of money in the markets over the years, but being in the right place at the right time really helps. I know some famous people like in the option market that made a lot of money. And they'll tell you flat out, I couldn't do that again today because things are different. But you can't take away what they did because they can say, well, they were in the right place at the right time. Well, they also had the mindset and the mentality to recognize that they were in the right place at the right time and realize that they had that opportunity. So if you're doing this, this 
deep, intensive studying of the markets every day and every night, you're going to be able to recognize when conditions are good, what conditions are bad. And sometimes when they're just mediocre, you might just want to sit on your hands a little bit. And the more you do this, the more you're going to be in tune with whether you want to take action or not. And lately I've been like, geez, guys, I can't find anything to say in my life. Here's a couple things that I'm looking at. But why don't we just sit on our hands a little bit and let's see if this market can make it to new highs and let's see what's going to set up next. And one thing you'll notice also in doing this is sometimes you start getting this big sector rotation. And we're going to take a look at all that in just one second. But like yesterday, it's kind of cool. You know, transports have been started to take it off. They were doing pretty bad for a while or, or chopping sideways. And now all of a sudden they got a bid yesterday. So that's kind of a cool piece of the puzzle, a cool developing event. So you have to look at everything. You'll also learn that, that there's not always a bull market somewhere, but sometimes there is. And that's what I wrote about in layman's, that the average stock was down just like the market by the middle of the year, about 50%. Some were down worse earlier in the year that had recovered, and some were, weren't quite down that much. But for the most part, nearly every stock went down. And you'll see these bozos on TV make it sound like, oh, you just got to find the bull market because it's out there. Well, it's not always out there, but sometimes it is. And sometimes you get a choppy market like we've seen over the last couple of years where there's not an overall bull market, but if you work hard, you'll say, oh, look, energies, uh, metals and mining, uh, IPOs. There's been a lot of little stocks that have been taken off. It, it's some big stocks as far as energies and, IP, uh, energies and metals and mining are concerned. But you'll be able to find those bull markets when they exist, or you'll recognize that they don't exist. Don't exist. And there's nothing wrong with that. Again, you're going to become more and more one with the market through these observations. This is probably one of my favorite. This is actually in. Uh, I was looking at. I was searching my hard drive for some some uh, resources for today's. Uh, presentation and it, it, it was bringing up excerpts from from the layman's guide to trading stocks which i wrote in 2008 2009 i think i think it was officially published in 2010 baseball is 90 percent mental and the other half is physical well if we apply that to trading trading is 90 percent mental and the other half is methodology money management So this is my recent example, and it's going to be turned into – it's probably going to turn into one of my dead horse type of examples. Somebody beat me up a while back because I kept showing examples of one of the same stocks. But here's the deal. As the, the preacher who kept saying the same thing every week, and one of the parishioners pointed it out to him, he says, I can't help but notice you're saying the same thing every week. It's like, well, but keep saying the same thing until you people get it. So this was a trade not that long ago, back at the end of August. We had a buy. We had a stop in place. And then the trader called me the day before it took off to say that he was getting out because of the volume. And then the next day it hit the initial profit target. And then it stopped out of the scratch. But that's better than the poke of the eye. It made 50% on the first part, as I wrote in Friday's column. And um, if you don't feel like reading it, I, I, I read, I'll read it to you. If you look on my homepage, I have the podcast up there and oh by the way if somebody does I, i'm having a podcast issue if somebody knows podcasting uh shoot me an email and we'll do a little uh quid pro quo or something uh deja vu all over again which is one of my favorite things i say that so many times in my column and sometimes i forget it's yogi but it's definitely yogi who said that first and then once again here we have deja vu all over again pi stopped out but it also set up again as a new trade and it doesn't always work this well obviously if it did you'd never see my fat ass again as i often joke but as you can see it pays to follow the plan for when it does and the beauty of this particular plan was it wasn't like there was a little discretion happening where you had a little stop nick or you had a bit of an opening gap reversal you had to deal with or something that requires a little bit more advanced knowledge and you could argue that, well, maybe that's in hindsight or whatever. This unfolded exactly to plan. And I got the email a couple of days into the trade. Makes me want to take the position off a of pie for fear it will also go lower. 
this gentleman was concerned because the portfolio was was in a bit of a state of a drawdown and which I learned a couple of weeks ago thanks to one of my clients Dr. J thank you Dr. J if you're out there today if you're busy saving lives that's uh that's good too uh, you'll catch a recording. I know you will, but uh, I want to give you a shout out and thank you for that. But she sent me a video on YouTube uh, from Robert Frey, who talks about the fact that 75% of the time you're in a state of regret. In other words, you're in a state of drawdown. We talked a lot about that in last week's show. So it's normal to feel stress. In fact, you're probably going to feel stress 75% of the time, unless, of course, you embrace that and just get over it. But this gentleman was concerned Dr. Lance, because he saw this portfolio eroding and he was thinking about getting out of one of the few profitable positions in the portfolio. OK, and then, of course, the next day it hits the initial profit target and then some on a gap and the stop is, is raised to break even. And so far, so good. Knock on wood on that one. Now, this is something that I'm trying to tell my uh, try to tell my millennial children, especially my older one who is uh, finishing up, hopefully finishing up her last semester of college as we speak. You've got to be very careful if you don't know where you are going because you might not get there. And here's the dead horse beating coming up. Plan thy trade and trade thy plan. So, again, I can't promise you that I won't continue to show that prior example, at least until a new example comes along, like I did with some other stocks not that long ago, and I got uh, kind of chastised for or criticized for or whatever the word is. But sometimes it is that simple. You can plan the trade and just follow the plan. Now, it does take a little experience because you will need to apply a little discretion here and there, but a lot of times, in fact, discretion, from my analysis, discretion only really is necessary about once every three months, but it's very important to know when to apply that discretion. But for the most part, 99% of the time, I would say, you just have to plan your trade and follow the plan. Now, wing it will work for a while, but not much longer. And I don't want to get into a big, long discussion on why people wing it, but the, the bottom line is it's more fun to wing it. And following your plan can be difficult because sometimes you're going to have to quit. And it's just more fun to wing it. And sometimes the market can be a bad teacher. And I'm sure we're going to talk about that in one second. In fact, I know I will. But the bottom line is it's it's more fun to wing it. It's a lot more exciting. and before we even get into a trade, winging it by not making a plan, I see that a lot. And the reason people do that is the moment you put a stop in a plan, that's the moment you have to admit that you could be wrong. I, I, as I said before, a friend of mine uh, from Russia, I actually went to Russia with him, uh, and we both spoke at a Forex conference. Uh, he, has, he says he has no expectations on a trade, and he's very um, – unemotional about that well i expect every trade to go to the moon but i'm prepared for the fact that it might not work out so i kind of like to see it as a little bit more glass half full uh, as a potential going in otherwise why would you take the trade to begin with but i do like where he's coming from in that you don't put these big expectations so you're not disappointed when things don't work out All pitchers are liars and crybabies. And my version of that, I guess, is all traders are crybabies. If I tell you there's nothing to do, what happens 10 minutes later? I get an email. It has to be something to do. If we're trailing a stop on a position and it stops out, I got an email, we gave it too much open profit. People focus more on what they lost or gave up than what they made. And as I say every week, beating the dead horse, here it comes again. If you're pissed off because you made money, 
then keep enough money out, go get you a little massage, and send me the rest of that money, and then you don't have to be pissed off about making money anymore. And as I wrote in the last column, I was complaining to a trader once because I got a crappy fill on something, and I made a tremendous amount of money on the trade. It was a, a really – I didn't have a huge position on, but I had some options on that just went crazy deep into the money. And I think I got like a three-quarter skittage on a fill or something. It was kind of questionable, kind of dubious. And I was just moaning and groaning and groaning about that. It was like a 40-point in the money option trade. He's like, let me get this right. You made this tremendous amount of money and you're complaining. You're not happy. So you have to really be cognizant of your feelings. And as Robert Frey says, 75% of the time, the market will go against you. And as I also wrote in Friday's column, again, I'm really pushing that column for some reason, uh, I was watching Pi, the stock we were writing about, the stock we just talked about, and it was up like 14%. Well, it starts dropping. So now my observation is like, whoa, here's a stock that's dropping, and it was still up 11% for the day. It actually finished the day up 20%. But the more you're watching that, the more or the chances that you're going to feel that state of regret as it goes against you. So the market actually encourages you to be a crybaby. I think it's what I'm trying to get at. Uh, we didn't take 100% when we had it. This happens quite often, what I call the better than the poking eye trade. We get in here, we get out here as a swing trade, and then it comes down and stops out 0%. So overall, you make 1% of your portfolio. Better than the poke the eye. And sometimes this happens, usually, if you're going to make that, if you're going to hit that additional profit target that stops out, usually it's just a blip up from that oversold condition. Uh, I'm sorry, yeah, from oversold back up to, I guess you'd call it overbought, and then it just dies out. Usually this happens pretty quick, and you make 1% overall. And if you were to annualize that out, your returns would be something like 150% a year or 200, 300% a year. So annualize, and I know you get into a lot of trouble when you start fooling with statistics, uh, damn lies. What's it, statistics? Damn lies. Lies, damn lies, and statistics. But 1% is much better than a poke in the eye. I knew I should have gotten out. Trade goes against somebody. Then they get all stressed out. I knew I should have gotten out. I knew it was going to go up. Well, if you knew it was going to go up, then why didn't you make a plan to take the trade? You can't, you can't observe what's happening and then have these thoughts in your head. And when it happens, don't do anything. So if you think something's going higher, then then trade it. Then make a plan and follow the plan and actually trade it. But I get a lot of emails, oh, I knew it was going up. And then the list goes on and on and on. And I didn't want to think about too many of them or dig through my old emails because I know this is is could be framed as a bit of a negative, but everybody complains a lot. And, you know, present company included, okay, uh, as I'm getting a little bit older, I, of course, my wife will argue with this because uh, she's always saying, in my case, age doesn't guarantee maturity. But as far as markets are concerned, I feel like I'm maturing a little bit to where my emotional round trips aren't as frequent. I'm not getting as excited as I used to. I'm still dropping F-bombs. I'm still getting pissed off. But I'm learning to recognize that. I'm learning not to watch the screen as much. And... I'm learning not to get as excited about giving up some of that open profit. It still sucks. I still hate it. There's a lot of things about this business I'll never solve for and I hate, but you just have to deal with it. And guess what? It's not just me and you. It's everyone. I've known some, uh, and still know, some very uh, accomplished money managers who have gone through some pretty serious drawdowns. Now, I didn't call them up and say, hey, does it suck to be you? Because I know it sucks to be you. And I've had some other peers like point out, like, good Lord, look at the draw, like a uh, like a nagging whatever. You know, it's like, look at the drawdown this guy just had. It's like, well, geez, you know, it'll be your turn in, in the barrel soon. Just relax, okay? None of us could get out alive. We're all, we're all not immune. But so you know that everyone is going through this. 
You just have to deal with it and not be a crybaby. Now, let's frame it a little bit more positively, or let's get to a positive quote here. And this is important. I tell the kids, somebody's got to win. Somebody's got to lose. Just don't fight about it. Just try to get better. So you will have losing trades. You will have drawdowns, as I preached, or constantly preach. Just try to get better. And how do you get better? Well, there's a bunch of things you could do philosophically and actually, but just on the next trade, and only in that next trade, follow the plan, okay? If you can't make one trade where you plan to trade to trade the plan, then maybe you shouldn't be trading. And I rarely, I rarely say that, but if I get hit by a beer truck tomorrow and you don't, and I forget to say that, and you keep trying to trade for the next 10 years without planning your trade and trading your plan, you're going to lose a lot of money, and my job is not done. So just for one trade. Now, trading is all about, like life, just getting the repetitions in. It has to become habitual in what you do. It has to become a habit. And there's a lot of good books out there on developing habits and all, but the way you develop a habit is to just do it, get the repetitions in. So what the way you get those repetitions is you do you do what you're supposed to do. And you only have to do it once, that proves you could do it. Then you do it twice and three times and so on and so forth until it becomes a habit. Now, you also have to learn to pick the best and leave the rest. Now that's a cliche, but are you seriously doing that? And if you go watch last week's week of charts, you'll see Someone who's a pretty good trader when he wants to be. I say what he wants to be because he's always looking for action. But what he wants to be, he can follow the plan. He can get in the right stocks. Whether I pick the stocks or he picks them, he could pick pretty good stocks. But what does he do? When there's nothing to do, he wants to buy Coke, which looks like an electrocardiogram. And I really thought that he was busting my chops. And come to find out, he wasn't. So... Or are you really picking the best and leaving the rest? Now, huge fan of deliberate practice, and that's something that I've read extensively on, and I think you should too. Read uh, everything by Malcolm Gladwell. Read Outliers by uh, Malcolm Gladwell. I think Thinking Fast and Slow, and I don't know the author's name on that, but I think that they cover that a lot. Um, Linda Rasky talks a lot about deliberate practice and the importance of it. So that deliberate practice, what you're doing is you're looking at those charts. So you're not just looking at them without thinking. You're looking at them and saying, okay, I just I see this big move this stock has made. Or it could be in the market too. It's like, was there a pattern there that I could have caught? And sometimes I get a little aggravated because it's like, yeah, there was a bow tie there. How did I miss that? Or there was a nice pullback, a persistent pullback a TKO or something, but that happens less and less because I'm practicing deliberate practice. So don't only practice, practice deliberate practice, work to get better and better. And always ask yourself, could I have caught this move? And sometimes, no. The answer is no. You can't catch every move. And I get emails from people, why didn't we get this stock? It's like, it, it's going up 200%. Well, it, it just never really set up. It just kind of chopped around and went up in a, in a fashion that didn't really adhere to the methodology. Now, if you're seeing that over and over and over again, stocks that are going up and you're missing a lot of them, and your methodology did not recognize that, pattern that it took off from or whatever and maybe and just maybe I don't want you to be really careful in this but maybe through many many observations through a lot of empirical research you may find a pattern that you want to incorporate into your setups double top knockouts I remember uh, were one of the ones early on where I missed a few of those because I, I guess initially I was thinking that looks like a little double top I'm gonna leave that alone it's like wait a minute this is actually a tradable pattern 
in more recent times, and it doesn't happen as much with me because I think I've I've seen it all, and there's there's nothing new under the sun. But in more recent times, I did make a few little discoveries in IPOs that they have these certain breakout characteristics that have worked for the past two or three years incredibly well. And you learn that through a lot of observations. So you can learn a lot by observing. You can, you can observe that. You can observe a lot by watching. This is one that I use quite often and often forget that it's Yogi that said it. But it was Yogi. In theory, theory practice the same. In practice, they are not. So with that said, learn the theory and see the practice for free. So I needed a special offer to put in today's uh, show, so I thought this would be a good one that fits with the, fits the theme. Garbage in, garbage out. If you're picking the best stocks to begin with, you're going to do a lot better, and it's going to be a lot easier to follow your plan if you're getting a few winners. And as they often say, there's three strands or three cords when it comes to trading. Obviously, money management methodology, but also your mindset, the mind. And if you're picking better stocks, your psyche is going to feel a lot better, your mindset is going to be a lot better, and you're going to be more likely to follow proper money management. Following proper money management, you're honoring your stocks because you're getting rid of stocks that are stinking up the joint, and you're riding those winners because that's where your big money is coming from. And if your stock picking has gotten better, getting back to the methodology, then you're feeling better about the methodology, you're feeling better about yourself, you're following the money management, then you're picking better and better and better stocks. So what I would encourage you to do, and obviously I have a vested interest in this because from an ego standpoint and a monetary standpoint, I'll make money, obviously. But if you get the stock selection course, I'll give you a whole year to the service for free. And then that way, you can see the theory. I'll show you how I pick stocks. And then the next year, you'll actually see me put the theory into practice. And, and anyone who has been serious about doing this, I've never gotten, I haven't gotten any complaints. I guess I'm going to jinx myself. But anyone who's really serious and really studied the course and really paid attention for a whole year has been very happy to see things unfold. Now, it doesn't always unfold great. We don't always print money, but that comes with the territory and that comes with the learning and that's and that teaches you a money management lesson. So you're always learning something. But anyway, very proud of this, as you can tell. Now, there's a bunch of other yogiisms out there and obviously we can't cover them all today. We made too many wrong mistakes. Now, that one could be, we could probably do a whole seminar just on that the problem with markets is sometimes you can make a mistake and get paid and that's where that that bad teacher thing that i'm always beating a dead horse on comes to mind so you could make a mistake and still get paid now was that a wrong mistake well my quick answer is yes because that wrong mistake is going to perpetuate into the future. When, I don't know if I've told this before, probably have, uh, when I was newly married to my wife or we were uh, seriously dating, I had like a dinghy or something or something that I sold around the house that was that was uh, I had with my boat. And I sold it for a couple hundred bucks. It wasn't much, but just a couple hundred bucks. And I said, you know what we should do? I said, we should go down to the casino, hit the crap table, and parlay that money into a grand or two. And she's like, yeah, that sounds like fun. Let's do it. So we hopped in the car, went down to the casino, spent the night. And I think we made $1,200 shooting dice. I don't know if that includes a $200 or not, but roughly 1000 bucks. And I told my wife, I said, this is the most expensive trip we've ever had. You, you will ever have to the casinos and she's like what do you mean we want a thousand bucks i'm like no you're going to be back and you're going to want to go back okay so sometimes the market can reward you for a mistake whether it's a wrong mistake or not so that's where you have to be really careful and again we probably could could go um on and on on that one even napoleon had his word gate uh and i guess that kind of dovetails into what i already said about 
friends of mine who run a lot of money, they still occasionally have bad times. And Robert Frey, who ran billions and billions and billions of dollars, actually did the research and said, hey, you know what? 75% of the time he's having a bad time. So don't feel like you're the only one. Even Napoleon had his water gate. In baseball, you don't know nothing. <laughs> In trading, you don't know nothing. Okay, once, once you realize what you don't know, or once you realize you know that you don't know, then all of a sudden, your life gets a lot easier. I never blame myself when I'm not hitting. I just blame the bat, and if it keeps it up, I change bats. After all, I know it isn't my fault that I'm not hitting. How could I be mad at myself? Well, I guess the lesson there is a lot of people blame the markets. And as I also wrote in layman's, yeah, sometimes it is the markets. But if that market's going straight sideways and you're a trend trader, and by the way, the only way to make money Trend trading is the what? I'm sorry, the only way to make money trading is the what? Catch a trend. So if you're a trend trader, or as I like to call them, a trader, and the market's going straight sideways, and simple things you could do to see if the market's going straight sideways, like, hey, where's the market today? Oh, it's at 2175. Hey, where was the market a month ago? 2175. Where was the market two months ago? 2175. Okay. What's the net net change? If it's not changing, then there's no trend to catch. And just like you can't catch a tan when the sun's not shining, you can't catch a trend when there is none. Okay. Now, as I said earlier, maybe if it's going straight sideways, you could dig and dig and dig and dig and dig and then and then find something. But if you can't find anything, like recently, don't try to make something happen. So don't blame the markets. And conversely, don't confuse brains with the bull market. That's another problem that I see quite often. So sometimes you're in a ridiculous market where everything you touch turns to gold. Don't let that go to your head. I've seen people do some really stupid things in life from that. And they later regret it. It's kind of like, uh, you know... <laughs> Didn't they like, uh, wasn't there a story where somebody faked a lottery ticket? I think it was a kid. He faked a lottery ticket, photoshopped it or whatever, and, and uh, told his mom they won. And the mom went to her boss and told him to F off. You know, so so don't, don't fall into that trap. Sometimes it's just the market conditions that are, are making you feel like you're a genius. It's not the actual, it's not your actual talent. And, and there is, there is psychological backing to that. It really is. And if you look at these behavioral finance books, which I have a stack over here, I plan on getting around to reading, but they, they all kind of sound the same after about three. So read two or three of them and then maybe skim the rest. And that's what I, uh, that's what I've been doing lately. What's the last, uh, I, I started reading one last time I, I, I went out of town and the first chapter was really good, and then it's like after a while, it just it was all the same thing that was in every other one. I'm trying to think of the name of it. I would tell you not to read it, but I guess that's not fair because if that's the first one you read, it would make sense. But anyway, if you do dive into these behavioral finance books, which they all start to sound the same after a while, they'll all explain that we as humans tend to equate luck with skill. So if the market is doing really well and we're doing re really well, we think that, that it's our skill. But if something bad happens, we tend to equate that with bad luck. And that's just human nature. And my epiphany over the last five or so years is, is just to recognize these things and embrace them and maybe become a little bit more antiseptic. Like knowing that 75% of the time I'm going to be in a state of regret, that makes me, that makes it much easier for me to recognize that, hey, market's going against me, but it probably will most of the time. But if I stick to the plan longer term, that's the thing to do. So 
remember, it's you that's trading in less than ideal conditions. It, it's you that's trading for action. I mean, that's that's the hard part of this business is nobody blaming on, you know. <laughs> what did I write about a while back? Uh, know all the <laughs> it's like know all the women aren't out to get you at the office, you know, or I'm plotting to kill you. Um, the market's not out to get you. You don't have to swing hard to hit a home run. If you got the timing, it'll go. That's a pretty good one there. So, especially as a trend follower. So it's like, don't worry. Don't worry where the market's going to go. What did Yogi also say? The future ain't what it used to be, right? So, but don't worry about where that, that market is going to go after you get in. Because it's going to do what it's going to do, Okay. And as I often preach, this could probably be also said as what I'll often say, obsess before you get into a trade, not afterwards. Okay, so you want to obsess here. You want to pick the best and leave the rest. And then once you get in it, just let it unfold. Okay. And don't watch a screen if there's nothing to do. Because, again, here comes the beating of the dead horse. This is going to be my new favorite mantra for a while. Because if you do, the majority of time, you're going to be in a state of regret. Now, this one was kind of interesting. If the world were perfect, it wouldn't be. And this is something that you're probably going to see me expand on quite a bit in future broadcast. And... The thing about that is the, re the reason technical analysis works is because markets are imperfect. And the same things that make you profitable from the market standpoint are the same things that also frustrate you as a trader. So if a market starts trending against you, it's, it's the, the market's participants are beginning to get into a certain state, okay, and causing that trend. That trend is going against you. Well, you might be in the wrong side of the market, and it happens. But the same things that make you profitable are the same things that frustrate you. So the emotions of the others in technical analysis is – my definition is reading the emotions of the others while embracing your own. So I'm throwing in a little trading psychology there too. So if the market were perfect, it wouldn't be. If the market were perfect, it wouldn't be a market that you could actually trade. So you have to embrace that, that imperfect nature of the markets and realize that because the market is imperfect, you're able to trade it. I'm hoping that makes I'm hoping that makes some sense because that the emotional nature of the market and even your emotional nature as a participant is what makes a market. So if the market wasn't perfect, if the market were perfect, it wouldn't be. So that's pretty serious stuff there. And you know what's kind of cool is that I read a book about Yogi many years ago on a plane. Just picked up something in a bookstore on the way, you know, on the way to the uh, gate. And uh, he – he claims he just this stuff just comes out. He doesn't sit around and try to make up a yogiism, which is kind of fascinating. And there's even even a yogiism on that. Um, and finally, it ain't over till it's over. So getting back to the I told you I'd beat the dead horse on this one. Getting back to the second pie trade, we've gotten in. We've taken partial profits. We've trailed the stop. And then now, big question mark. So it ain't over till it's over. And one thought that comes to mind with this is a lot of people, and already, I mean, on this day here, halfway up on this day, got an email. Hey, you think it's done? You think it's over? I don't know. It ain't over till it's over. So let's see what's going to happen here. And then hopefully, and I hate to use the word hope, but hopefully we're talking about this example six months from now. We 
CENX was one that triggered in February and it's still open. So that's six months later. We're still talking about it. So maybe we'll talk about this one six months from now. But don't try to outsmart the market. Don't try to pick the top. Don't try to predict the future. The future ain't what it used to be, but maybe it is in this particular case. I'm still working on a beginner's course. This has turned out to be much more massive than I ever thought it would be. But I think it's going to be pretty cool, and I'm pretty excited about it, even though it's just a beginner's course, which seems kind of boring. But the thing about it is, when I got into it, as I've said quite a few times, I realized that the mentality was more important than the actual methodology. Methodology is important, but you have to learn how to think about markets properly. And even if you're much more seasoned, you may have lost sight of that. And ironically, last week I get this electrocardiogram of a chart from a client who should have known better. So once the course is out, I'm going to send it back to the course and say, don't ever send me a chart that looks like that ever again. And don't talk to me again until you watch this course. Um, all the examples I use in these presentations, and I may have one or two charts that I've used over the years that weren't, but for the most part, I would say 99.9 .9 of everything that I show is directly from my trading service. So what I would encourage you to do is get on the delayed service and follow along, at least in delayed. And I've actually had a couple of people, not the soft Sally, but actually a couple of people that made profits in a delayed service, and they were so successful with that, they said, like, you know what, I'm going to... Uh, I'm going to go ahead and sign up for the real service. Any questions, Dave, DaveLeonard.com, and then check out all the free stuff, obviously, on my website. All right, let's hop into the overall, uh, take a look at the markets. You guys want to start asking about individual stocks, uh, feel free to do so now. Phil says, now I know what I'm doing wrong. My arrows are yellow and not blue. Zen question for you. I have an easy time making a plan per trade, but I can use some help on a business plan or overall trade plan. I am liking what you have to say. Thank you. I have an easy time making a plan, but I have some help on, I need some help on a business plan or overall trade plan. I am liking what you have to say. Thanks. Um, I'm not sure exactly what you're asking, uh, kind of something a little bit more broader based. I have to be careful and not come out as like a, uh, what do you call those guys, RIA or something like that, or financial planner, because I'm no longer registered. I was only registered as a commodity trading advisor. I'm no longer registered as that. So uh, everything I say is for educational purposes only and entertainment purposes. Hopefully sometimes I do say something funny or write something funny. So, um, yeah, if you want to email me on that or if, there's, you, if you want me to um, elaborate on something, I'll be happy to do that. I could take a plan and plan the trade, but overall, I don't have an overall plan if it if that clears it up. Um, well, do you have an overall plan when it comes to trading the methodology? Do you have an overall plan when it comes to trading? My whole, I don't know if you're going as far as like a big portfolio or a big uh, diversified portfolio, some trading, some not or whatever. But my whole feeling is there are no good investments, quote unquote investments. But that doesn't mean you can't find a little metal stock like we found back in February or a little IPO that we found throughout the years. And the last one, obviously, is PI. And ride it for as long as the trend persists. And... It's kind of interesting, as I've said quite a bit, I joined the uh, American Association of Professional Technical Analysts. Greg Morris was, uh, recommended me and sponsored me. And in one of his speeches, he said, follow is the key word of trend following. It's like, wow, well, well, I do that, but sometimes you have to get back to these basics and just say, well, we just follow along. So I think there are no good investments, but that doesn't mean you can't stay with something for a long, long time. So if you're making some sort of big grandiose plan, 
just always keep that trend following in the back of your head and follow along. So if you're trading some ETFs or something else in addition to the trading of the stocks, just keep a big picture trend following and keep it simple, by the way, type of analysis in the back of your mind. All right, let's take a look at the overall market and let's pop out to your individual stock questions. Keep them coming. Keep them coming. Yeah, Phil, I'm not sure if I answered your question or not, but uh, feel free to shoot me an email. We can elaborate further on that. It could, ev could even give me fodder for a column. So uh, fodder for a column, I guess. Fodder for a column would be something else. Let's take a look at the overall market. Okay, you said, okay, well, uh, shed some light on it. Fantastic. Yeah, and I think that's, you know, my kind of, uh, my way of looking at it is don't overcomplicate things. In any type of quote-unquote investment, I'm making little air quotes in the air. Don't you hate people to do that? Well, I'm doing it right now. But in any type of investment, it has to go up. And there's nothing out there. There's nothing in the world that I know of that you could say, just buy it and forget about it, okay? You want to buy something that's going up, or at least appears to be turning back up as an investment. And always remember, and I know, duh, Captain Obvious, right? Whatever you invest in has to go higher in price. So you want to be a trend follower in everything you do, and that's just me. Your mileage may vary, okay? All right, let's take a look at a piece here. Uh, off a smidge today, no big no big whoop, but we're kind of stuck in this range. And one thing I was pointing out to my clients, it's like I was giving my presentation last night to my clients, and I was like, oh, wait a minute, HV is eight? I could never remember an HV that low. Maybe somebody can plot the HV and tell me when it was that low in a piece. But that means that not a whole lot's happening. We're in a bit of a hold, holding pattern. This may be in part, by the uh, by our election here I don't know but you can see we're sideways at best traders usually don't tend to agree for long and when they do the market that the move that happens afterwards could be quite substantial so if this thing gets tighter and tighter and goes longer and longer we could see a significant move out of the range uh, it still wouldn't surprise me to see the mother of all shakeouts below and then it takes off again. We saw a microcosm of that back here. Remember, we had this low volatility situation. We had the fake out. Go back and whatever date that is. Go back and watch the weekly charts from early uh, August and you'll see me talk about that. And then there was a nice little pop out of it. Not that it's tradable or you want to run out and trade it because it's a, such a short-term type of thing. But it is it is a good little tool to have in your toolbox or an arrow in your quiver or whatever analogy you want to use. But something like that I think could happen again. We could see a shakeout below and then takes off. I'd prefer if it just took off and took off. You know, that'd be great. But if it did shake out below, we could have a big move out the top of the range. But as a trend follower, there's not much trend to follow. NASDAQ off a little bit. No big deal there. Uh, stuck at a somewhat shorter-term sideways range. My big concern, uh, again, has been that we really haven't cleared this prior high decisively just yet. But as a trend follower, I'm not going to argue with a market that's at all-time highs. Let's take a look at the Rusty. By the way, I think last week uh, somebody emailed me and said they don't – they don't like my little nicknames for everything. Well, the nickname for the Rusty came from a client. So if you want me to stop using the Rusty or you want me to use a diff different name, just become a client and tell me. <laughs> I'll do that. I'd be happy to. Uh, Russell 2000, uh, not setting the world on fire, just this upward drift. I'm not a huge fan of upward drift in markets. I actually like to see a market kind of take off and have a little bit of a downward drift. I like to see them do this and just kind of drift lower. Because this kind of gives you this corrective action, whereas this is kind of like the last of the Mohicans just kind of buying along the way. Now, you can't time off of this because this could go on for a long time. So 
just don't get it too too excited because it's going higher because it's been a bit of a drift. But what is 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 it higher or lower? It's higher, and then the beauty is there's not much uh, overhead supply left. Okay, takes a little getting used to, but he will get over it. <laughs> yeah, become a client, and I'll call it whatever you want. You know, if your name is is Josh, I'll call it the Josh. You know, if you're a good client, you know, let's take a look at the Josh 2000. I guess I could call it by its real name, but um, there are reasons why I called these names uh, going back in time. There's a story behind each one of them. Anyway, so far so good. Pushing through his overhead supply. Not too much further to go. My only concern, and I was talking about this last night, is when you have a V-shaped recovery, and it doesn't look like a high level. It looks like it's coming off a low level. But if you back the chart out a little bit and gain a little perspective or maybe even look at like a weekly chart, you can see this is a V-shaped recovery at high levels. I like V's at bottoms. You know, look, look at that V right there. Look at that, look at that V. It's huge. It sounds like Tiny Elvis, right? Back here in 2002, 2003. Anybody old enough to remember Tiny Elvis? Uh, look at this little V bottom here, 2009. Okay, I'm much more excited about that than I am about one at high levels. But again, what is is. So let's just follow along and see what happens. Uh, sector action kind of mixed throughout hardware just banged out new highs pulling back a little bit today semiconductors eh, losing a little steam in here but for the most part they've run out pretty nicely and maybe it'll just flatten now pull back a little bit take off again so far so good there drugs eh, not so hot they try to take off him right back in transport so it can be kind of mediocre for a while but then yesterday Beginning to break out a little. I mean, I certainly wouldn't rush out and want to trade anything. It looks like this. It's, it's a mess. But at least it's at one year plus highs or new highs for the year at least. So that's looking good. Energies. One thing I've been telling uh, my peeps quite a bit is that the reason we didn't go after energies when they started to spill a little bit or to a lesser extent the metals is because with these commodities, when they stall out like this, if they're at Longer term, fairly low levels. If you look how high they were in 2014, okay? Look how high they were in 2008. So historically, we're at pretty low levels, okay, in the energies. Okay, lowest level in, what, 10 years? So I wouldn't rush out at shore up just yet because they can have nine lives. And look at the energies banging out new highs today. So we could start seeing some new setups here soon. And this is why we have an energy related. This is why we don't bail out when we have an energy in the portfolio, even though energies overall begin to weaken a little bit. I have found through many, many years of, of trying to outsmart the markets that a lot of times you're just better following along. And that's how I got the name, obviously, Trend Following Moron. So just follow along, let it unfold, and realize that it will go against you here and there. Metals overall look a little dubious, but they made a pretty good comeback in here, okay? And again, they're at pretty serious lows, probably even more impressive than the energy. So let's take a look at a monthly here and zoom in a little bit. I mean, it certainly were at much higher levels in 2008, 2010, 11, and then we're, we're down with 50% or more. From there, so we're down 80%. So you don't want to rush out and short a market at that low levels longer term. And this is why we're not that excited about shorting the metals, even though we saw a few setups in the golds and silver. Speaking of which, there's the golds and there's the silvers. They look a little dubious shorter term. I think the bow ties are still working here, but these aren't really super duper bow ties. Super duper bow ties would be those that are coming off of major, major long-term lows like right here or major, major long-term highs such as maybe 2000 and when was the, the peak in the metal? 2011, okay? So major high like this, you get a transitional pattern. That's a big deal. Something in between, if you want to trade it, knock yourself out. It's just not as exciting for me to trade. I find through the years I've, I'm looking for more and more perfection maybe to a point of a fault certainly to a fault with my clients who are craving action because i'm telling them a lot of times just sit in their hands so that's the metals uh retail looking pretty dubious in here we got a bow tie off of all-time highs this is concerning 
there is a lot of support below the market. But if you look at the individual subsectors here, it's looking a little ugly in retail. So we might actually fire off a short or two, even though the market overall is at new highs. But I've got to weigh that and think, well, do I really want to short with the market at brand new highs? In 2008, the answer was yes, because I couldn't find a long to save my life, and there were tons and tons of shorts setting up. So who knows? I kind of feel like right now, market's at new highs. We see a short or two setting up. We might do one here and there for S&Gs, but for the most part, we probably don't want to fight the overall market. So retail, not so hot. Uh, some of these interest rate sensitive areas have gotten whacked here and there as of late, like utilities and a couple other ones in here, REITs, utilities. You see utilities, bow tied down. They're crawling back up though, but they bow tied down not that long ago. A ditto for real estate, you can see kind of rolled over here, but it's coming back a little bit. So kind of mixed overall throughout the sectors, but quite a few are at or near new highs like the overall market. So you want to err for now on the side of the overall market. All right, let's take a look. If there's no more questions on individual sectors, let's start looking at some of these uh, stocks. Uh, Donna wants to take a look at TPIC. TPIC, let's get this up. Okay, a stock at new highs is not set up, obviously. But what do you do with it? Well, you put it on your watch list. So this should be on your watch list because it's banging out new highs, okay? Voya, okay to buy here? Well, let's take a look at that. Um, I'm not seeing it. The problem that I'm seeing, and this is where I would tell you, even if you, at the least, if you don't get the stock selection course, go in and, and watch this video. Let me show you where it is. And watch um, a dozen of my week of charts where I often talk about these things. But if you go to the store and you go over to the uh, stock selection page right here, buried down that page there's an intro video somewhere where is it there it is right there there's an intro video on stock selection so at the least make sure you watch this video because in that video i'm going to point out things like overhead supply and this one just has a mountain of it and there's nothing magical about my form of technical analysis and again if a mark if the market were perfect it wouldn't be the fact that overhead supply works human nature never changes people hold on for dear life they might even buy more stock as it drops, but then they're going to be inclined to get out of break even when it hits this area above. And that's why I wrote recently when a friend of mine visited and starts telling me about his, his foray into the stock market. And that's why I wrote that technical analysis is alive and well, because human nature never changes. Okay. If the market were perfect, it wouldn't be. Run on a breakout above seven. Let's take a look at that. Uh, no. Uh, this is a, a relatively new issue, but it's kind of wide and loose. I think I would hold off on this one. Now, there are some caveats I occasionally will make with IPOs. So, yeah, I like the way you think in that above seven. Yeah, let it get above seven, but I don't think I'd trade the breakout in and of itself. I mean, you could certainly do much worse because IPOs do have a bit of a breakout characteristic to them, but this is not quite still an IPO. It's, it's what I call a toddler, but they're still worth trading sometimes. What I would do is I would let it get maybe above eight or so and then look to play a pullback because that at that point, you'd have a big picture, cup and handle, uh, the bow tie would still be in place, and it might look pretty good. So, yeah, put it on your watch list, but let it break out. Airgy on a pullback? Yeah, that was a pullback uh, not too long ago in the IPOs. The only thing I didn't like about it was it didn't pull back enough, but it did have some breakout characteristics to it. One, two, three, four, five. 
based on one, this is the, uh, this is one breakout that was kind of interesting here with this one. Uh, so far, so good. But yeah, wait for the next pullback. Pullback was a little shallow for my taste in here, but hey, so far it's working. Sometimes you have to uh, be willing to let them go, but it did officially trigger uh, a pattern back here. Uh, Air G, buddy, yesterday at 11.96. Cool. Uh, sold a third of my position after the afternoon at 32 lock an additional profit. Can you connect? come in and profit take it zone and stop placement? Okay, well, yeah, John, it, it obviously you have to learn somewhere and somehow. Uh, a stock like this, it looks pretty volatile. Uh, I would give it, believe it or not, I know this will sound crazy, at least two points of wiggle room. So if you're getting in at 12 round numbers, then 14 would be your profit target. And then at this point, you bring your stop to break even. So 12, 10, and then 10 to 12, and then 14 would be your uh, profit target on that. And if you were, if it did just hit that profit target, what you could do is say, okay, well, it hit the profit target. So let's just see if it keeps on going. And then you could, you could actually trail a stop intraday on that. Um, I wouldn't trade in thirds. The, the, I've, I've tried everything under the sun. And I, I worked really hard to try to trade in thirds. It's too much trading. You're not making enough on the big winners. And you're not really mitigating losses that much. So it's funny. The longer I'm at this, the, the, the simpler I make it. So the simple way of trading is just, let's say you buy 200 shares, flip out 100 shares. That way you just flip out half and hang on to 100 shares in these trades or if you're trading a thousand shares with about 500 just keep it simple but yeah this needs to be on your watch list and on the next pullback it might be worth a shot e m e s keep them coming uh this one has been catching my eye uh, i do like the fact that it's coming off of major Major, major bottom longer term. I bet there's something something happening weekly here. Not as much as I thought there would be. A weekly bow tie soon, maybe. Um, again, I'm not a breakout player with the exception of certain IPOs, but it is beginning to break out. Now, this overhead supply kind of jumps out at me, but that's 2015. It's a lot of it, but it's also at 50 bucks a share. So if I could get in somewhere in the teens, and it goes to 50 bucks a share. I'm going to be pretty happy with that. Okay, that's another thing that I talk a lot about when it comes overhead supply. But I'm not a breakout guy, so what I would do is let it, except for IPOs. And I got to, I hate to keep saying that one caveat, but it's true. See if it keeps breaking out, and then look to look to play some pullbacks along the way. Pa, I don't know that stock. Pa, pa. Oh, it's pipeline stock. Um, it's just chopping its way higher, which I guess is okay if you're long. As I often say, if a stock could just keep working its way higher very quietly before you know it, it could be at a pretty high level over a period of time. In fact, I love to talk about the pies because it's fun, you know, because it goes straight up. You're like, hey, look at me. I'm a genius. But obviously, this is not sustainable. Might end tomorrow, might end the next day, might end next week two weeks, three weeks, but something that's just kind of creeping its way higher, that sometimes could be a lot more sustainable. But I like to seek perfection going into a trade. It's like I like them to do this once I'm in them because that's sustainable, but I wouldn't rush out and buy a stock just because it's kind of creeping higher. I would wait for some acceleration higher and look to trade a pullback uh, with the caveat that you do have a little overhead supply. I guess that'd be a good problem to have, but by the time – it sets up for me, you would be past 30, and then you got some trouble at 45. I just think there's better things you could find out there. So I would focus on doing that. Good stuff. Thanks. Got to go. Hey, all right. Thanks, Phil. T low. That's been kind of an interesting one. T W L O. Would you look to enter on a pullback, or does the failure at 60 negate this trade? Well, a little too many days in the in in the pullback. Let's see, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21 days. Is that right? Is that about a month's worth of trading? Let's see. 
15. Yeah, it's getting there. It's getting quite a few days of trading. So I'd say it's too many days of the pullback. What I would do with this one is let it break out the new highs or see if it breaks out the new highs and then trade the next pullback there. Now, I can be a little bit more lenient in IPOs, but I think this is too many days. And keep in mind that I do sometimes look for perfection. EMES, I did not ask you about it as it does not fit your methodology, but I bought it during your show, smiley face. Oh, okay. Are you talking to your position? Somebody else asked about it too, so. All right, any more stocks? To answer your question, John, yeah, I would, I would, it doesn't look horrible. You could do much worse. I mean, if you still played it as a pullback, maybe an entry here, but I would actually be a little bit more picky and just wait wait to see if it sets up again you know so far with the ipos it seems like a new nice hot ipo comes along fairly quickly and has been coming along fairly quickly i i don't know when that's going to end but it's been really nice for quite a while so i would continue to focus on the on on the ipos but look at look at some possible other ones and then once this market or if this market breaks out we should start seeing a plethora of new setups okay um any more questions? Would the VIX be a good trade during election season by December calls? No, I would. Here's the thing. If you – the VIX is very complicated, okay? And if you start – the VIX is a derivative. The VIX is the at-the-money options on a hypothetical 30-day uh, period. So it's very complex. And if you're going to buy calls on a derivative – then you're buying a derivative on a derivative of a derivative. It's just really, really messy. And I'm sure you're not the first person. No, I'm not picking on you because you might be on to something. Don't let me talk you out of something if you think you're really on to something. But I would avoid those type of trades. It's very dangerous to try to make those type of plays. And I guarantee you those calls are probably expensive based on the outcome of the election. Funny, I turned on CNBC yesterday, and the guy comes on and says, everyone knows that the IPO market has been difficult and challenging. Laugh, you're killing it in IPOs, John. Thank you. Thank you, John. I appreciate that. Yeah, it's like when I – yeah, it's – well, I don't want to – let me just take the compliment and not try to flatter myself more. But, yeah, A-R-E-X on a pullback, A-R-E-X. Yeah, just be careful with the with the VIX thing. It, it's just dangerous to, to do – I. Here's the deal. Unless you're going to make VIX and options your life, then stay away from VIX and options. I watched a, a speech done by Larry McMillan, and a lot of people, and, and, and he's the people even get on TV and say the wrong thing. Uh, I don't want to throw anybody under the bus because I, I try to work hard not to, uh, and, I, and, and I wouldn't want somebody to throw me under the bus either. That's why I don't do it. But – Larry McMillan gave a speech. It was really good, and a lot of people are, are buying like futures on VIX, VIX futures, thinking they're doing one thing, but the world's a lot more complicated than it looks when you start messing around with the derivatives. So leave those derivatives alone unless that's what you want to make your livelihood. And even then, like some people going on CNBC saying the wrong thing, even then, make sure you really do understand what you're doing, okay? Uh, not for me, not my cup of tea. Yeah, AREX on the pullback, absolutely. Uh, does have some overhead supply to deal with. So this might be a Potter Stewart type of trade. We'll know it when we see it, but it would have to. I'd like to see it break out a little bit more and then see what happens after the pullback. But this would bother me a little bit back here. So uh, maybe keep an eye on these energies. There might be something else developing with the, uh, with the energies beginning to make new highs, okay? Ron says, thanks to the coach. You're welcome, Ron. Yeah, let me know how that works. I mean, if you do take that trade, let me know how it works out one way or the other. My only concern is the it's such an obvious thing that I would imagine those calls have already priced in that, that uncertainty. So it just doesn't – it just sometimes just doesn't work, okay? We had a day this week where VIX was up and XIV was up. Bubble heads do not understand why, but this could happen easily, education. Yeah, you know, derivatives of derivatives of derivatives, it gets pretty it gets pretty nasty really fast. And 
so you got to be really careful and these are inverse you know the, the simplest the easiest way to trade an inverse ETF is to just uh, this might be a good this might not be a good example but usually an inverse ETF will uh, will usually go down forever eventually because of the, the way it gets marked to market and the way they're forced to buy in at lower levels and all it's a little bit more uh, it's it's pretty complex but yeah it's kind of interesting that, that this is headed higher that's that's fascinating but yeah don't trade anything unless you really understand what you're doing and the VIX is it really I wouldn't apply regular technical analysis to the VIX it's a different type of technical analysis the VIX is a little bit more truer reverting to the bead type of market because you're playing actual volatility. So I wouldn't go out and, and apply generic technical analysis to it because it's, it's, it's a different type of creature. All right, any more questions? Quite a bunch today. All right, while we're at an impasse, obviously I want to thank everybody for coming. I appreciate you taking the time and your busy schedule to be here. I love doing these shows, as you can tell. It's the highlight of my week, so thank you for being here. I'm humbled that you guys and girls would show up to uh, to listen to me on a Thursday. So thank you so much. Uh, any unanswered questions, Dave at DaveLandry.com. If we don't talk between now and then, everybody have a fantastic weekend. And hopefully we'll see all you guys and girls again next week. Thank